Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. Thanks for tuning into this fun rebroadcast episode. Melly and I will be back from our short break next week with a new episode. For this week, we're rebroadcasting our very first Let's Talk episode from a couple of years ago on the Tommy Westfall Universe Hypothesis. I think this episode is really fun, and I think about this wild piece of media trivia pretty often. And I also think it helps put our fun fictional fair into perspective, that none of it matters that much. It's all just in some kid's head. Anyway, enjoy the episode. <music> Hey, Melvin. Hey, Dan. What's going on, man? We begin our story on May 25th, 1988. (laughs) The final episode of television medical drama, St. Elsewhere, is airing its series finale. In the show's final moments, we see main character Dr. Donald Westfall talking to a colleague in their office about the events of the episode while his son, Tommy, runs in and looks out one of the hospital's windows. Suddenly, the scene transitions to a different shot of Tommy, now sitting in an apartment with his grandfather as he stares at a snow globe. Strangely, his grandfather is played by actor Norman Lloyd, who had previously portrayed one of the doctors at the hospital. Suddenly, Dr. Westfall enters the apartment, only now he's dressed like a construction worker. He and Grandpa then talk about his construction job before they have the following exchange. Father, how's he been? Referring to Tommy. He give you any trouble? Grandfather, He's been sitting there ever since you left this morning, just like he does every day, world of his own. Father, I don't understand this autism thing, Pop. Here's my son. I talk to him. I don't even know if he can hear me. He sits there all day long in his own world, staring at that toy. What's he thinking about? As the scene comes to a close, Tommy shakes the snow globe before his father places on top of the television set. The camera then zooms in on the snow globe, which has a replica of the hospital the show has been taking place in, inside of it. You got a reaction to that so far, Melvin? So, or? wait. <laughs> is this like is this like the end of a series and it's one of those gotcha, it's a dream the whole time kind of things? So, St. Elsewhere, which takes place at a hospital. Is that what uh, the show's called? St. Elsewhere. St. Yes. Elsewhere. It takes place at the St. Eligius uh, Hospital. Yes, so the clear implication of this episode's final moments, or... You know, it's vague, but it's very obviously um, the most popular interpretation is that the final scene of the show reveals that all six seasons of this television medical drama have in fact taken place inside Tommy Westfall's imagination. And uh, I mean, this isn't an uncommon trope. The original series uh, finale for Roseanne revealed that the entire final season had been novels being written by the lead character Roseanne after her husband John Goodman had died which I don't know if you knew that about the original final season of Roseanne the the only final season of an old show that I know of that's controversial was ALF and it's because in the last episode the US government abducts ALF and there was supposed to be like a movie or like another season 
and then there never was. So literally, if you watch this <laughs> wonderful family television show, the final episode ends with Alf being taken by the government to be dissected. Yeah, back when television <laughs> shows had some guts. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like to see Disney do that with Loki. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the final season of Quantum Leap, they thought they were going to have another season, but they didn't. So in the last episode, they just added a final voiceover where he just says like, and now we'll continue to keep leaping until like whatever. Like the implication is just he never finds his way home, despite the fact <laughs> that's the entire point of the show. Uh, my favorite little um, weird thing is there's a television show called I Married Dora, which lasted for six episodes in like the 1970s <laughs> or something. And in the final episode, the characters are all they're at like an uh, an airport, and the dad like leaves to, to go on his flight, and then they're like, oh bye bye, and then he like walks back and goes oh man it's been canceled they're like your flight and he goes no we have been and they all turn just wave at the camera and that's the last <laughs> episode and uh it's like the show doesn't even have a wikipedia page is there anything but what is so okay we're talking about the like final episode canons <laughs> being weird like no, what's going so, on continue with me for a second okay i'm with you uh part of there are two main things that make this last episode bizarre outside of the inherent weirdness of it the first is that saying elsewhere part of what the show kind of made its name on was the fact that St. Elsewhere was a relative, was a really gritty, like dark comedy uh, that dealt with some really like hot button topics at the time. For example, the show, which debuted around ooh, like sometime in the eighties, um, it ta- tackled the ongoing AIDS epidemic at the time with main mm, characters okay. contracting HIV and AIDS. It was a very realistic show, which makes this sudden shift into what could be generously called science fiction or fantasy. That's all very high concept for, a young autistic boy to make up in his brain while looking at a snow globe. Right. But the other weird thing is that like many other television shows at the time, St. Elsewhere had a, has taken part in multiple ways in various crossovers. Uh, it wasn't uncommon at the time for networks to try and get their shows to cross over in order to, to you know, create right. like fans of both shows or right. for shows that run by the same production companies to try right. and like get some cross promotion. Uh, so, for example, during the second season of Cheers, barmaid Carla gives birth to a child at the hospital in St. Elsewhere. I think I'm starting to see what's happening okay. there. Uh, okay, we'll continue on. And in the first <laughs> okay. season of St. Elsewhere, Jack Riley appears as a patient, reprising his role as Elliot Carlin from the Bob Newhart show. And perhaps most famously, St. Elsewhere writer Tom Fenton went on to be a writer and producer on the show Homicide Life on the Street and incorporated multiple references to the show on Homicide. The most Notable example of this is bringing back the character of Dr. Roseanne, Roxanne Turner, uh, played by Alfre Woodard in the episode Mercy, where she actually plays a doctor who uh, is accused of mercy killing one of her patients, continuing the fairly gritty and realistic tone. The episode actually uh, earned actor actress uh, Alfre Woodard an Emmy nomination. Mm. Now, here's where TV nerds will no doubt recognize the real significance of this particular connective tissue. Um, and this is something that I, for a while, I thought was really super common knowledge. Uh, but as time goes on, it becomes less and less notable, which is that homicide life in the street exists within the larger law and order universe. Uh, we could spend the rest law and order universe, law and order. First off, law and order, the television. This industry. means it connects to Arrested Development because Professor Munch from SVU yes. makes a cameo so, in Arrested Development. Are you about to tell me that all of these shows so, take well, place so, in the snow globe? <laughs> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Oh, my God. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, we could spend. So, yes, I'll just cut to the chase with the Richard. So Richard Beltzer plays the character of John Munch. Uh, he John. Now, John Munch character player Richard Beltzer is really weird and interesting, partially because he's literally a character that just originated on one television show, Homicide, and which is brought over to Loner SVU uh, for whatever he's reason. He's a great character. He's a great character. And Detective John Munch has. Um, made subsequent appearances outside of SVU. He's appeared in, of course, Rest of Development, which I, I knew you would like. He appeared in multiple Law and Orders. He's appeared in the X Files, The Wire, The Beat, and as the same character, as the exact same character. The character <laughs> played by Belzer <laughs> has appeared in over ten different shows across five different networks over the course of twenty years. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, when he officially retired, and the retirement episode on Rest SVU is really fun because the retirement party, his ex wives from Homicide, are in, are there at the party too. <laughs> yeah, because isn't Munch like married to like a bajillion people yes. or had like a family? marriages yeah yeah at the time of his uh, uh retirement from the character he became the second longest running television character uh beating out kelsey grammar's fraser who pre- played fraser across cheers and fraser the person who beats him is actually mariska hargitay who's also on all svu right 
Yes. Now, and you've kind of already getting, caught where I'm getting at here. And so I'll pose this question to you. Does this mean that every show that touches St. Elsewhere exists in Tommy Westfall's head? Is Munch just one of the best characters she's thought of? <laughs> uh, because if that is true, if we're going with the logic of because St. Elsewhere uh, is directly connected to Homicide Life of the Street, which is directly connected to Law and Order, therefore those also exist in this kid's head, this creates kind of a problem. Because, okay, De- Detective John Munch exists in the X-Files universe. S- several shows. <laughs> so, yeah, let's just go with one of these shows for a second. X-Files includes Lone Gunman, Millennium, arguably The Simpsons. And in one episode, they bizarrely cross over the television show Cops. So all those shows apparently are also fictitious in this kid's head. And so the extended law and order, Chicago universe, there's a whole bunch of Chicago PD, Chicago like uh, fire. Uh, that includes The Wire, the BBC, BBC show Luther. Uh, so all the shows are in there and supernatural ran for like 14 seasons and had crossovers too. Cause right. they had crossed over with Scooby-Doo. Did Scooby-Doo ever cross over? <laughs> well, let's follow one thread. <laughs> oh my gosh. We mentioned the show cheers, which means Frazio, Frazier, Frazio, um, <laughs> Frazier's cool brother, Frazio. Uh, we mentioned cheers. <laughs> the cooler Frazio. <laughs> the cooler Frazio. <laughs> So Cheers, which he crosses over with Frasier, obviously. And now there's a sh- there's an episode in Frasier, which crosses over with the John Larroquette show and Caroline in the City. Matthew Perry appears as his character Chandler from Friends in the show Caroline in the City. And Caroline also appears in an episode of Friends. So Friends is also in there. You may not know this, but the easiest way you can show your support for Cinemac Doctrine is to rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So press pause and share your thoughts. We'd love to hear what you have to say. And then press play again so you can hear the rest of the show. Now, Friends had a crossover episode with Mad About You and Mad Men of the People. Phoebe from Friends also appeared in the show Hope and Gloria and so on and so on. So then because of all these connective things, do all of those things also appear? (laughs) Is Friends now in there? Uh, Remember how I mentioned the Bob Newhart show earlier? Yeah. Well, characters from that show appeared in the show Coach. Co- <laughs> Coach took part in a massive crossover event called Viva Las Vegas, which saw all the sh- shows, cr- the show crossover between Drew Carey show, Coach, Ellen, and Grace Under Fire. Kathy, Kin- Kathy-, Kathy Kinney's character Mimi from Drew Carey show was so popular, she appeared on Two Guys and a Girl in a Pizza Place, The Hewleys, and The Norm Show, the show short-lived two seasons she took with Norm MacDonald. The Hewleys regularly crossed over the show The Parkers, which itself is a spinoff of the show Moesha. Moesha as a show has its own self-contained universe uh, due to the connection with, with writer Mara Brock Akil, who, in addition to the Parkers and Moesha, wrote the show Girlfriends in the Game. And both of those shows technically exist in the same universe that take place in the same uh, area and a babysitter character shows in both shows. <laughs> Moesha, the characters from Moesha attended a prom in the television show Clueless. The television show Clueless um, has a crossover with Sabrina the Teenage Witch when she visits their high school. Sabrina the Teenage Witch has a second season crossover where it's Boy Meets World, You Wish, and Teen Angel. So, is all... any show real? So, are all <laughs> Do these shows. Do anything is real? <laughs> I don't even know anymore. Isn't that wild? So, all these shows, because if actors were prizing the same characters, by the transitive property that we established, because that's generally accepted, correct? Like, if Homicide Life in the Street, everyone ex- agrees that that show also exists in the law and order universe because you have detective john munch who has uh shared continuity with those shows sometimes it's conflicting and it's almost like a running joke where they mention different wives he's had right uh, but it's generally accepted same show it gets this game gets really ridiculous if you start to count things like name drops and background appearances uh right such as like a vehicle or ship in the background you know, because we, it's generally accepted that John Munch exists in the Luther universe because um, Idris Elba in that show mentions, oh, uh, like he has a contact named Detective John Munch. So the John Larroquette show, which is not a show that I'm sure you're familiar with, not a big John Larroquette head or anything like that. <laughs> no, I don't know. I have never watched that. <laughs> so it, it take, basically the whole thing takes place at a, at a bus station similar to the show Taxi. Now, they mentioned that the bus station was was created by the Yo-Yo Dine Corporation. Are you familiar with Yo-Yo Dine? No. Yo-Yo Dine is a uh, fictitious defense contractor network created by uh, Thomas Pinchon for his series of novels. Uh, Thomas Pinchon is oh, a- Oh, no. Are we about to cross mediums? Well, no, no, no. So, okay. So, Thomas Pinchon is a semi-controversial writer. As Some people think he's genius. Some people think he's complete nonsense. 
Um, we're not going to get into that today. It's a little bit out of the scope. However, <laughs> Yo-Yo Dine has become one of those like things, kind of like the Wayland Utani Corporation, where writers just like using Yo-Yo Dine as like an inside joke. The problem is if we accept that Yo-Yo Dine being a singular corporation, that creates a problem because Yo-Yo Dine, in addition to creating the bus station, the John Larroquette show, also creates parts of the ship this very ships in star trek it's mentioned as a company in the never oh my story. <laughs> it's mentioned as a company in buckaroo banzai and it also appears in the buffy spinoff angel as a um a client of uh of the um, lawyer uh, group whose name is at the moment no show is real <laughs> no show is real uh so like the whole buffy verse is in there apparently and also angel the same uh lawyer um uh, that what not what not they're called lawyer firms legal firm also represents Wayland Yutani at one point. So that also throws in Alien, Blade Runner, Predator This is like franchise. the timeline to Primer. Yeah, it's just, just, like, just a mess. <laughs> just and this is this is even not including things like um, the fake cigarette brand, uh, From, like, Morley Tarantino. Cigarettes. No, not uh, Apple, Red Apple Cigarettes. Morley Red Cigarettes. Apple. So Morley okay. Cigarettes, for those who don't know, it's a fake um, cigarette company that that's a used in like a company yeah it's made used in a ton of uh movies and stuff if you it's need a cigarette company yeah. everything so if you count yeah. that too um <laughs> this is a fun game for nerds you know because you reward them for knowing lots of stuff you just go through imdb and wikipedia and look at like okay like this actor's and this is this well that means it's this thing right and it sort of acts as a self-congratulating exercise for nerds obviously right but like you know i return to my initial question if we're gonna follow the rules of obsessive comic book fans and nerds which is this is this is the same logic of comic book crossover essentially? How do you feel this, Melvin? Do you agree with the posited idea of the Tommy Westfall universe hypothesis, as it's referred to? Like, I mean, initial reaction. Like, obviously, you're, you're having all on the other end of the, of the of the microphone here. I can hear you freaking out, but let's <laughs> like verbalize your freak out for a second. How are you well, feeling right now? So, just some for some behind the scenes for those listening. Like, our intent for this episode is to discuss canon. Like the value of canon or lack of value of canon. Cause like one of the big frustrating things in geek culture is people get so specific about canon Uh, that you're spoiling, you're spoiling the fun. (laughs) No, but like why I'm mentioning that is because we're now finding out that like, if we want to get anal about canon, then we have to accept that nothing is real. And it was all made up inside the brain (laughs) of Tommy Westfall looking at a snow globe in which a hospital took place. And now everything's connected to this hospital, which I think is a great irony for the fact that we need to just accept that all this stuff is fiction. So who cares? (laughs) Like, it's just fun. Um, What canon is what is in front of you in that moment and whatever's newest, frankly. So my first thought is like, great (laughs) like that's what that frankly that makes it more fun for me to think like if i had this secret knowledge that tells me munch is the key to everything like (laughs) kind of like how george lucas is like uh what is it jar jar is the key to everything yeah yeah, it's like munch is the key to to understanding these shows i think this is awesome (laughs) i think this is the greatest thing i've ever heard discussed on the cinematic doctor podcast (laughs) because it's it's almost as good as our golden globes episode where it's like i get to understand that like wow nothing matters anymore (laughs) this is such a relief off of my back when we're discussing an episode and i accidentally misquote something and you're like actually melvin just to protect (laughs) you from all the nerds that'll be in your dms uh this is the real thing i get to come back with well it's all fake it's in tommy west westfall's brain I'm in love with this. That's what I, that's what I'm feeling. <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad because so this has become one of the fun online games. There's a whole blog that up through about 2016 was still being updated to chronicle every television show, movie, etc. Um, that uh, allegedly exists in Tommy Westfall's head. The um, the big some of the big linchpins is at one point there was there's so, through through classic television. There's a crossover with the old OG Batman television show, which via crisis on infinite earths was established to exist in the larger in the DC larger, i was gonna continuity. say there's got to be a connection so to, that sucks yeah. all the dc properties in there too everything because yeah even um ezra miller appears yep. in the crisis so, of infinite earths which means Zack snyder's justice league takes place in tommy <laughs> westfall's brain in tommy's head now there so this before i get into kind of like the origins of this whole thing there's been there's obviously some objections to this because this is not a perfect system and it's one of the things it's partially it was purposefully this way so um there's actually been some like actual like academic looks at this sort of hypothesis and so the easiest most obvious 
issue with this is this does happen in real life um, all the time. For example, it's a classic trope for television shows to have an episode where characters appear on the Jerry Springer show, for example. That doesn't mean Jerry Springer is a fictional <laughs> character. We know Jerry life. Springer is a real person. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's not a thing, you know. And this time you're also aware that there was a period where uh, Rudy Giuliani just did tons of cameos and and or Donald dif- Trump in, in different in, um, um yeah. and Donald Trump and appears in various movies and films. Uh also the, the only person to appear in both the original Schumacher, the Nolan and the recent DCU Batman films is a senator from vermont because he's just a big batman fan i should know his name off the top of my head but he's appeared in tons of batman things he's also appeared in batman the animated series because he's just such a big batman fan and he also donates all the proceeds from these uh appearances to a library where he read comic books as a child very wholesome figure that's cute i don't know anything about politics please don't tell me he's a terrible person or anything enjoying this episode Grab that share link and tell your friends. Word of mouth is the most effective way for a podcast to reach new listeners, so don't be shy. Share the episode wherever you can. So, like, obviously, it's not a perfect system, and it's that way on purpose. This entire Tommy Westfall universe hypothesis was initially popularized by a man in 2002 by the name of Dwayne McDuffie, who's writing for a website called The Slush Factory. Uh, And... For those who do not know who Dwayne McDuffie is, Dwayne McDuffie is one of the unsung heroes of comic books. He co-founded uh, Milestone Media, which the purpose was to create uh, comic books focusing on more diverse characters, the most famous of which, of course, is Static Shock. He created the character of Static Shock. Awesome. He also created Damage Control as a concept. He pitched it as a sitcom that takes place within the Marvel Universe. Uh, Dwayne McDuffie uh, sadly passed away um, at the only age of, like, I believe, 49 from complications oh, of heart man. surgery. Mm. Uh, however he was responding to fans writing to him because in a recent episode of the static shock television show, the characters of Batman and Robin from the Batman, they made series appeared in static shock. And so he was writing about how most people were really pumped about it. I, it's a great episode of the television show. However, there are some people who are writing to him concerned that this appearance might affect the continuity of the Batman, the made series, which would no doubt affect Dwayne McDuffie because he was also a writer on the various DC animated shows, most notably as a writer on Justice League Unlimited. Um, And so they're like, what does this mean for the continuity of Batman? What does this mean? And so in short, his response was, it doesn't. It doesn't affect anything. His Right. So in his original article, he's explaining how all these absurd uh, connections that are taking place should, he said, comic books should essentially, essentially follow the rules that television has. Uh, so for and as he was laying it out, the implications of saying elsewhere in his tapestry of crossovers, he was laying it out as an ex, as an explanation of the absurdity of this logic. His point is that every TV show by design essentially always exists in its own continuity, like the continuity of Arrested right. Development, for example, is like, its own yeah, thing. John Munch can just show up and doesn't matter because, you know, that's its own thing. And right. so sometimes they show up and it, the way he put it is that you can have the fun without the baggage of having yeah. to worry about keeping everything straight. Of course. And McDuffie ended his column like this. So what does this prove, other than the fact I've got too much free time? Well, my point, and I do have one, and I can steal this catchphrase because, as I've already proven, Ellen DeGeneres never existed, uh, is that <laughs> while guest shots and crossovers can be fun, obsessive cross series continuity is silly. It is silly. It's silly in comics, too. Yeah. Relax and enjoy the show. And... It is kind of a beautiful irony that his purposefully ridiculous like exercise uh, to to illustrate the futility of like keeping like obsessive uh, eye on continuity has become a game among nerds to show how far crossovers can go, where everyone took his his uh, what's the term reducto ad absurdum. And then just went and we're just like, no, he's right. It's all in this kid's head. And now they're all chronicling it. What a good irony to just basically, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter because really it would take place in this. Oh my gosh, he's right. Does the entire <laughs> mad film. Oh no. Now, to be fair, you know, and I can argue before I get ahead, I know some, most people do this as a fun exercise. They just want to see how far they can stretch the premise and so it's forth. It's like Bacon Number, trying to see your Bacon Number, which for those who don't know is basically because Kevin Bacon has been in so many movies – it's possible that you are friends with someone who's worked with <laughs> Kevin Bacon or as who knows someone who's worked with Kevin Bacon. And so the average Kevin Bacon number, which is how many degrees away you are, is about two. And for me, I actually found out because um, this is a long time ago. My number is two because I have – my mom has a friend who I've met. So that's 
one connection who used to work like in Hollywood as, as an extra and was an extra in one of the movies that Kevin Bacon was, Bacon was in. It was either that or worked on Family Matters and other shows. And one of the people on Family Matters was in a movie with Kevin Bacon. And so you get to see your connection. It really doesn't matter because right. I don't know Kevin Bacon, <laughs> but it's one of these things where it's kind of fun to figure it out. Yeah. So if you don't but know- But you exist in a universe with Kevin Bacon as you've exactly. established. Yes, uh, I do. <laughs> it's, it's, so yeah, the initial blog post by uh, McDuffie was actually called Six Degrees of St. Elsewhere, uh, <laughs> playing off of Cute. that. So it's funny. This is, yeah. Yeah, but his entire point is this like continuity is kind of, it is its kind of own thing. It doesn't matter, you know, yeah. it's silly to worry about it too much and really it should just like when it pops up, it should enhance what you're enjoying. And then when it's done, you just keep focusing on what you're enjoying, which I think is a nice thought. With that in mind, let's talk about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> does it matter no <laughs> loki makes it clear anything can be canon well some of the old movies could have been from a different universe doesn't matter <laughs> so um this and this second part was so long i wrote a seven part uh outline but i decided <laughs> that it's nobody wants to hear all that so there's gonna be three basic parts to this uh part one is what i like to call the big uh shift which is some of you may remember this, this these Hallison days. Uh, so, but you may be able to remember when big franchise movies basically existed apart from one another, and that was fine. That <laughs> like was you would nice. occasionally was have a, nice time. Uh, a Freddy versus Jason type situation, Alien or, versus and, Predator, yeah, which has AVP event. Wayland Yutani alive, but like in 2006 yeah. and it's like how is that possible when aliens takes place and well like... it's possible because tommy westfall is clearly imagining all of it as we right established. exactly <laughs> but you'd have the mummy come out and then dracula 2000 would come out and they didn't connect and you wouldn't worry about it you have an american godzilla movie while there's also a whole a toho, toho series yeah. happening at the same time um, and there are multiple dc and marvel movies happening without not even any hint, connection not even a whisper yeah. of a connection and it makes sense when you think about it. Like, why worry about crafting one singular, complicated mega franchise when you can have multiple profitable franchises and movies and projects going all like separate from one another? You can crank out as many Friday the 13th and Hellraiser and Puppet Master movies as you want without being worried about it messing with some overarching narrative. Like with Evil Dead, where literally the three Evil Dead movies <laughs> retcon the previous movie. Like right. Evil Dead 1 happens, but then Evil Dead 2 within five minutes goes, actually, this happened. <laughs> it just changes it. <laughs> where, and yeah. then, yeah, Army of Darkness is like, actually, this happened. It just completely does it again. The beautiful thing about Evil Dead 2 is the first half is just a remake of Evil Dead 1. Yeah. It's the same movie, just better. It's so good. Right. And now imagine all of that. If they were, imagine all these franchises trying to exist, but instead they're trying to craft a meta narrative where Freddy and Jason and and Pinhead were trying to stop a corrupted Necronomicon. <laughs> and they had to like rescue. Actually, they're the good Ash, guys. You know, and, and when they, they get to hell and we they have, have to fight such the sights to show you as he blows up Satan or something. Yeah, actually, that sounds awesome. <laughs> um, my dream Mortal Kombat game is just that, where like Shao Kahn accidentally corrupts like the puzzle box, and so well, then like, you should you need to start playing Dead by Daylight. They're putting the Cenobites in. Now. I know, I saw their yeah. I was, like, really you can get Chatterer as one of the legendary skins. I'm like, that's so cool. <laughs> that's so cool. That's so awesome. The point of this podcast is that Hellraiser is awesome, and like the second one's the best one. Which, you should watch actually, them. I wonder if Dead by Daylight's connected to the. Um, Tommy Westfall universe because now they have some way they have they have Michael Myers saw they have yeah because if they have a predator in, in there it's game over I would love for them to get predator in there in fact people have been pining for them to get alien in there somehow but uh yeah everybody everyone wins and they really want Jason I'm positive that they've already made a Jason model they're just waiting for the rights to show up but <laughs> there's no way they haven't made a Jason model <laughs> yeah but yeah th that's kind of how it was you know like uh we can yeah you can have all these different horror franchises if you want to cross you just it make really it bad, there's there's a yeah. comic book somewhere that does it there, there was a comic book robocop versus terminator a long time ago and you know while this is happening new line cinema they can make an Ari to blade movie fox can make a hilariously dated excellent movie where everyone dresses like a background character in the matrix and then like sony can let sam raimi make his version of spider-man where spider-man just produces webbing from his body for some reason yeah instead of using web shooters and that's fine that's fine. Warner Brothers can have four different people play Batman between 1992 and 2005. 
It's not a problem. And it's great. And some of those movies apparently are canon with each other. There's the same like uh, Alfred across the four initial Batman movies. So why not? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And this is normal. This was how it was. There weren't people online worrying about whether in the new Flash movie, you know, if Ben Affleck's Batman will be in it or if Morbi- Morbius, Morpheus, or if Morbius <laughs> would connect to the Sony verse of MCU. Morpheus a 40 in a death basket. Yeah. <laughs> And it's it's funny, like I when I wrote the thing about Morbius in there, um, this was before Michael Keaton just offhand in an interview with Variety was like, oh, yeah, I'm playing Vulture in that Morbius movie. And he's like, doesn't understand a comic book continuity works like they're trying to explain to him how he's in both franchises. And he's just like, I, I play a guy. That's I, I know that's what I, I have know. a script. I got paid. This is my job. But like because Michael Keaton played Batman <laughs> in 1989, back when the world was more normal. Um, back when Chevy Chase had a different family in every vacation movie, um, and <laughs> back when right. like every movie had like a direct to video sequel that maybe had one side character again back played the same actor. This is like um, you're actually just reminding me of how there's a um, I think it's um, 24 Frames of Nick did a video on like the fourth Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie and how it's a different cast. There's a fourth one. Yeah, and it's a different – they've cast everybody. And the the episode, I think, on his YouTube channel is called, like, Not My Roderick because it's a totally <laughs> different guy. And I was watching it because I was like, this is interesting. But it, at some point, it's just complaining about how it's all recast. And he's like, but what's the canon? And part of it is satire. <laughs> like, it's all a joke. And it's like – because in real life, all the actors got older. <laughs> like, it's just how it is. The, the Roderick from the first three movies got cast in a Quibi show. So, like, whatever. Which was really <laughs> important. Uh- <laughs> yeah, he had it's, to go do that step. You can't have a King Hearts thing where, like, you know, you have where, like, Sora is voiced by the kid from Sixth Sense, but now he's, like, in his 30s and he's trying to play, like, a 14-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> Want some quick updates on the podcast? Follow the Cinematic Doctrine Instagram for cool posts and story updates. Press the link in the show notes or search Cinematic Doctrine, that's one word, in your Instagram app. Oh, and we're on Threads. Check us out there, too. But, yeah, this is what canon used to be, kids. You know, and, like, I want to emphasize this was normal. Like, yeah, you, you that sounds there was a, so much more fun. There was, like, a big blow up at one point because like, there was a Christmas story, too, that was released home on DVD. And I was like, actually, it's the third Christmas story movie <laughs> because there is a canonical sequel to Christmas story with none of the returning actors, just the guy doing the narration who's the author of the original book. Right. So this is the third one. And nobody listened to me. And they shouldn't have because I was being yeah. ridiculous. Right. There's like four Universal Soldier movies that aren't considered canon because they just keep rebooting the franchise over and over again. This is like how Soldier is a sequel to Blade Runner just because there's one reference to like Tan Hauser Gate and like yeah, something else. The same writer came back. Yeah. And that's fine. You know, and it, there's a there's a beauty to that where it's like, who cares if, you know, the kid in friday the 13th is played by a different actor in every movie every like, single cares? one yeah tommy jarvis yeah. tommy jarvis is just he's just a he's morphs more than jason who looks different in every movie too right and to be fair that's kind of why the mcu approach was considered so novel at the time and part two is what i didn't give part two a, a title but anyway <laughs> but so that's that's partially why and the, the approach was so novel at the time the idea that like you could go see the Incredible Hulk. And I remember people saw that movie just because people were like, yeah, Tony Stark's in this one, too. I was like, what? That's crazy. You'd show up and Tony Stark was in it. And there was there's a level where I completely understand why it's so awesome. And so did Marvel, because what Marvel did is they then turned the shared continuity into its own um form of advertising for the films and i don't just right. mean i was just gonna say commercial yeah, yeah and it, i don't just mean that they were like go see this movie uh, because the same actor appears in it or they would have the post credit scene which they um they didn't invent by any means but they also they definitely popularized it but like what people don't also understand is that there was this whole viral marketing element to these movies that they didn't really even put a lot of effort into but like immediately and it came out right right at the time where like movie news and journalism on the internet was really exploding where there's like 50 articles of like here's all the hidden easter eggs you missed and here's like how we can predict what's going to happen red skull definitely going to be a villain in the avengers movie you know they have a black panther reference in incredible hulk and so there's all these really interesting things that online you could keep up with that are like this is really interesting canon and then you get to be the guy at your dinner party 
where you get to talk about <laughs> the Marvel universe and everyone else is like, who cares? They're just people in spandex. And then you're like, yeah, but this is going to become a billion dollar franchise and they'll all be sorry. <laughs> they'll so, be sorry. They mocked me for yeah. spending all my money on comics. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of like why. So this is why I'm not mad at them initially because they totally played it up. They did all of this advertising and marketing. And it works. And like, and I, I'm cool. not going to fault them. The Avengers made over a billion. I mean, like one point five billion dollars, something crazy. They ruined Hollywood forever because then everyone tried to copy them, not realizing it's kind of like a lightning in a bottle moment. And it only works. Ergo, the Dark Universe, which is like yeah. been rebooted three times. <laughs> it's alive in my heart. That's, that's what technically I'll say. it is still alive in the um, Lay One L uh, iteration. Technically, because Invisible Man is supposed to be the first of a new kind of dark universe. Of course, every the dark universe, every movie that comes out <laughs> is the new beginning of the dark universe. I wonder if they're it's, all in the same canon. Uh, maybe. Who knows? Um, but then there was this shift. And longtime listeners to the show will no doubt remember me making offhand comments or grumbling under my breath about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or the Netflix shows or all this stuff. And I'm going to lay my heart out there for listeners i'm gonna admit something right up front yes i maybe got too invested in this whole thing at one point <laughs> because this was my thick this was my first like nerdy thing i wasn't a star trek kid i like star wars as every kid born in the good old us of a like star wars but this is the first thing where like i was obsessively going online i was looking up like facts and and people writing theories and i watched the agents of shield season kevin premiere. feige was your best friend <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was the it was perhaps the most unhealthy uh, what's the term for it? <laughs> parasocial ah, relationship. Parasocial relationship of my entire life. And this is also their fault because man oh man, and they this is their dirty secret. They try and brush it under the carpet, which is the first season of Angel of the Field has tons and tons of references and it ties in the movies. There's an episode that opens up with them cleaning up after Thor the Dark World. The whole first season of the show literally is just a build up for the Winter Soldier movie. Characters from um, the the movies and television shows just kept showing up in each other's movies, basically. It's basically like so we're going to get into some nerdy stuff that people don't care about. But there's so there's this hierarchy of canon that the fans within the fandom, let's say, have, which is um, their contention is that no character who was invented by the TV shows shows up in the movies. There's characters who kind of were, went back and forth, but all of those characters originated in something else in the television shows. So Agent Sitwell, you may remember, is the guy who gets thrown out of the car when a soldier and hit by a, a semi truck. He is a regular character in the first season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. He shows up in a bunch of episodes. And in one of the coolest things I've ever experienced in my life, I sat at home like a faithful uh mcu fanboy watched an episode of agents of shield where a character victoria i think it's victoria hand goes up and goes agent said well you're needed on the lumerian star and he said well goes all right see you guys later and then that weekend i went to see captain america Winter soldier and at the beginning of the movie on the lumerian star there is agent said well that's cool and i was like this is awesome this is all i wanted and leading up to and where then he died so it wasn't an agents of shield anymore <laughs> Nice. Can you imagine writing a television show and then like they're like, "Hey man, you can't use this character anymore." Like, why? Oh, we killed him. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, okay. That sounds like a lot more um softer than like remember in Walking Dead, whenever like the actors didn't know if they were gonna die, and so then they apparently would have to like call them in and be like, "Hey, you're dying this season," and it was like super <laughs> emotional because they're like, "But you're my friends." It's like, yeah, but ratings are important. <laughs> <laughs> you're not moving up t-shirts. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, you know, Marvel did this, too, where they like their official Twitter accounts to be like, be sure to watch this week's episode before you see Age of Ultron. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And as I'm sure everyone knows, uh, Ike Perlmutter and Kevin Feige had a big blow up. And then thus the division started forming. And it creates this weird canon problem. For example, have you watched the Daredevil show? No, I haven't watched any of them. I think I've seen two episodes of the Punisher show and I like them. I just never continued it so the entire premise of the marvel netflix shows is this after the events of the first adventures film a bunch of gangsters buy up tons of of the real estate it's basically evil gentrification via super villains it's a really interesting premise for a television show it's like those two three episodes in invincible where the gangsters are owning a lot of the property and invincible yeah. has to go save them yeah, yeah. is invincible it's connected to the tommy westfall universe <laughs> Maybe who knows? Like <laughs> keeping an ear out for Yo-Yo dying or something. Yeah, that's um, right. 
so yeah so that's the premise of the show and so there's lots of cool stuff for like if when you go to the new york bulletin which is local paper you see like there are the articles that they've framed the wall are just articles about the various <laughs> marvel movies tons of cool stuff like that and there's an episode where like someone attacks jessica jones because they hate power people because during the during the events of end from just one their kid died and no one was there to save them uh-huh. and they blame superhero people okay yeah there's tons of cool stuff like that in the first couple seasons and then of course as split shows up those references become less and less right so here's the question if they're not can't if these shows don't exist in the Marvel Cinematic universe then what the heck is everyone talking about does do these shows then take take place in some weird alternate universe where 911 involved aliens or something like it you create this like weird thing where like these shows explicitly were created to exist in this particular continuity but they kind of now don't according to some fans because they don't want them to for some reason and because i mean you mentioned this in wandavision where like the necronomicon whatever it is in wandavision the book that uh the dark hold <laughs> yes it's a different prop you mentioned and yeah. you're like uh-oh that's not <laughs> that doesn't look the same because apparently it shows up in one of the other uh, shows i mean it's it's not that big a deal because the dark hold in the show in age of shield is established to also like shape shift so right so you're like ah, fingers crossed maybe it's still alive maybe they're still connected maybe, but... maybe maybe you know so like it, yeah it creates this weird thing and so the and to to cut this this discussion shorter than than i i could i could sit here and talk all day about this um, there's only one explicit thing in the entire of all the television shows. There's only one thing that explicitly is weird and kind of doesn't fit, which is the um, Agents of Shield was supposed to end after season five. And the president of ABC apparently is just a big fan of Agents of Shield because he like made them make two more seasons. So they literally wrapped up everything in season five, and they're like, "Oh crap, we gotta make more." Unfortunately, between season five and six, a little movie called Avengers: Infinity War came out, and there's no snap. There's no snap in season six of Agents of right. Shield. They just don't mention it. Right. Now, here's the thing. Every movie that we see that's supposed to be a true story um, that takes place after September of 2001, just because characters don't go, this is tough, and then look off the distance and go, but not as tough as that day <laughs> where Blades flew to a tower. That doesn't mean that 9-11 doesn't happen in that universe. They do that in Arrested <laughs> Development. Yeah. <laughs> Tobias is yeah. talking about like how their marriage is falling apart. Yeah, I don't, like, I don't want to blame 9-11. 9/11 <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Which is about? considered the first time like, uh, someone joked about 9-11 after 9-11 happened. In, really? I had yeah. no idea. It's there the first time or something. Been itching for Cinematic Doctrine merch? Check out the support tiers on Patreon. We're offering merch to those who support at select tiers. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and share your support. There's a link in the show notes too. But here's the thing uh, with with the way Marvel, Marvel fans do exactly what we were talking about how you shouldn't do it. Like this is <laughs> this is like exactly what Dwayne McDuffie was worried about, which is everyone's like, yeah, but no one explicit, explicit ex- <sighs> yeah, but no one <laughs> explicitly just goes. This sure reminds me of the events of season three of, Age of uh, episode five, of Age like of an Shield. episode of Family Guy. <laughs> yeah, there's no cutaways to right. the events of Cloak and Dagger, so who guess it's not canon. That's not how canon works. That's just like so. There's this whole thing of like everyone's both really obsessed with these shows being proven to be canon. Some people are obsessed with them not being canon because they worry that that means they have to watch them or they'll be left out in the cold. And so I want to posit based on this based on this exercise we've, we've had that it both matters a lot and doesn't matter. Here's where it does kind of matter. Where where I why this specific thing bothers me is that Marvel expressly as a marketing tactic told everyone that these shows were super duper important and you have to watch them or you're going to be li- miss things out and they're doing it again because of the disney plus with series disney plus right. and now they're doubling down on it with just this with these weird redhead stepchildren in, in the marvel snake universe and to me that is that is false advertising they like flat out were like oh yeah you gotta watch these shows they tie in and they all count but at the same time like it also doesn't matter at all because if you sat down and watched seven seasons of television show and enjoyed it and you watched seven seasons of television, and show you, you enjoyed, enjoyed it. it, right? You had a good and time. There's, <laughs> and there's no reason that these they can't exist in your brain in the same universe as these shows. Right. Are there some continuity issues? Yeah, but those exist in the movies as well. Also, I've never heard anyone be like, "Yeah, but the Incredible Hulk movie 2008 doesn't count because 
I don't know if you noticed, but Edward Norton hasn't showed up again. <laughs> or, you <laughs> That's know, right. yeah. or the first Iron Man movie where Terrence Howard is in it or all these other things that happen. <laughs> next time, baby. That are <laughs> next time, baby. The classic. The, the best classic. moment in time MCU. <laughs> or all these other moments that make less sense than any like minor issues with Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like we said, um, Homicide Life in the Street and Law and Order exist in the same universe, yet Detective Munch has a constantly changing backstory and everyone's totally fine with it. If we're going to sit there and say that these shows are also canon just because Mimi from Drew Carey shows up one time, then yeah, Lady Sif has showed up. Nick Fury has showed up. Uh, Maria Hill has showed up. Cloak and Dagger show up on the runaways and all this other stuff that goes on. You know, there's all these stronger connective tissues that previously, based on the previous rules, would totally mean they take place in the same universe. But because no one was taking it super duper uber seriously, now it becomes a weird competitive thing where everyone's like obsessing about it. And I think in some ways it does make things better. It's really cool. It'll be really cool. Hopefully, fingers crossed when Charlie Cox shows up in the Spider-Man movie or when Kingpin shows up again, who's like the best character in the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, and I'm standing by that statement. No so matter what. what should it be the same Kingpin as Daredevil? <laughs> like who's dead? <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it just comes back. <laughs> He's There's such a good actor. Disney in that can't movie. do He's doing um, great. <laughs> know, Michael Clark Duncan was so great. Good casting it is perfect casting. And so, like, it matters if it doesn't matter. And it's sort of like the main point I want to make. And I know Dwayne McDuffie wasn't said he didn't have a point. But my point is this, like, canon only matters to the extent that it when it, where it makes things better. And I think right. what bothers me about these is they're missing out on great opportunities where, listen, I don't want to watch a Daredevil movie where I get to see Daredevil become blind again and, like, be, learn to box again. You don't need to do that. <laughs> or you watched a whole season of television. That's very it, boring. You yeah. know? Build off on those characters. There's tons of great stories that they could be telling with because all of the groundwork has already been laid. And that was kind of the point of Instant of Shield. The idea was that they would lay the groundwork for all the inhuman stuff that the Terrigen Mist Cloud that made all the humans appear, all that would take place on the television show. So when they made the movie, they would need to bother because God knows there's going to be already so much stuff they had to establish, like the royal family and stuff, that all that other legwork would be done by the television yeah, show. Yeah, you'd have to do a four hour Snyder cut to introduce characters that didn't have their own solo movie. <laughs> yeah, which nobody wants that. And based yeah. on how the Inhumans turned out, they definitely don't want that. You know, so like there was an actual, like, kind of interesting plan at play that kind of got derailed for various reasons. So, yeah, like, canon should exist only the extent that it needs to and to an extent that enhances what you're experiencing already and that's kind of part of the point that Dwayne mcduffie was making which is that if you're gonna sit there and meticulously worry about the rules man you missed out also that's a weird way to watch television it is a weird way to watch the thing that broke my heart the most was when people when after endgame came out people were sitting there and they're complaining about time travel rules which just makes that specifically bothers me because time travel isn't real. It's not a thing that exists. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean the rules? Rules? Are you insane? Right. Um, and then we're like, well, Age of Shield, they do time travel this way. And the runaways, they do time travel this way. And then we see an end game, they do time travel this way. And it's like, it's a made up story. Like it doesn't, none of this happens. You know, it's like the great Grant Morrison quote, which I probably quoted before, but it's like one of the best quotes that ever existed. So I'm going to quote it again, which is adults ask dumb questions about fiction. You hand a kid fiction, they understand that fishes don't sing like they do in, in um, little mermaid but you can adult fiction start asking dumb questions like who pumps the <laughs> tires on batman's batmobile and the answer is nobody does it's a made-up story right and that's how this is it's a made-up story guys and the fact is the point of the story isn't whether or not the captain america who's at the end of the movie who's old is the same when they went back in time the point of the story is he finally got to have that dance with agent carter Right. That's the point of the story. He finally gets to go home and be the guy from Brooklyn he always wanted to be. He was a he was a reluctant hero who did what was right because he's a good guy and always did what was right. But he finally gets a thing that he wants after all the sacrifices he's made, after losing everyone he's ever known, after being the only guy who like from his time who exists except for Bucky, who's a brainwashed assassin. He finally gets to go back in time and be with where he belongs with the people that he loves. That's the story. Who cares if time travel is real? Who cares about mystical aliens with magic gems? That's not the story. Those are elements. Those are tools to tell a story. But the problem with all this stuff is people could become obsessed with the mechanics and tools of the story rather than the actual story at hand. And that's what's super duper annoying. And guess what? You know what else happened in Endgame, Melvin? I vaguely remember. I know it was three hours and boring. Go ahead. <laughs> You're the one guy that's like Endgame. I forgot. Um, guess who we get to see in a, in a sequence where they go back in time? Edwin Jarvis. Jarvis is there. He's a character created for Agent Carter. 
guess what? A character from a television show finally shows up in the movies. And guess what? People still don't think the show is canon. It's just like one of those things where it's just like nothing will make you happy. Like, because these rules, canon, it, it, like, it's whatever Kevin Feige feels like that week. Like, yeah, there's a time jump in Spider Man where, like, Spider Man, like, was it 10 years later or something insane? And then everyone ignores it because that doesn't make any sense. Wait, in which, like which Spider Man? In Spider Man, from- Spider Man Homecoming. Wait, there's a time skip that's just like 10 years it's, in that? There's some insane time skip in that movie. I don't remember. But it's like because they're the biggest glaring plot hole in the entire thing. Or there's like a time jump. Because like, you know, you just because John Watts, like an idiot, was just trying to make a movie, <laughs> you know, and didn't uh, double check with the encyclopedia of Marvel to make sure it didn't make anything that made any sense. Yeah, the, the show Bible, their, their MCU Bible that they have for all the Which has volumes at this point, I'm sure. You oh, know? my gosh. Yeah. It'd be cool if they started releasing p- bits and pieces for like past like phase one or something, phase two. Oh, yeah, I really. Cool. I mean, I think part of it's because of this thing we're talking about, where they're like, "Well, do we include it?" Because earlier handbooks of the Marvel Cinematic Universe included things like Agents of Shield, so I think they're worried, like, "Oh, we don't want to make the nerds mad," so they're just like not gonna like release anything. Well, this goes into even just a broader topic of like, does like you've already we've already kind of established like canon is whatever is in front of you in that minute or like Kevin Canon for Kevin Feige is whatever I'm feeling this week. And maybe he had a bad <laughs> week and that's why we get Canon where it's like, sorry, the Netflix shows aren't Canon. Yeah. Anymore. Guess what? Iron Man two doesn't count. Who knows why, you know, <laughs> Netflix raised their subscription price. That's it. <laughs> like I can't do it anymore. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's also this thing of like, what's so fun about the Tommy Westfall universe is the idea that like, um, at the like end of the with, day, none of it really well, matters. That, but like, <laughs> like down one street, it's like a funny sitcom, and you move over one street, and the events of the wire are taking place, <laughs> and it's just horrific. You know, to be that's way more, and that's way more fun. Like the idea of like somewhere the Punisher is like cutting off someone's fingers while like the cast of Agents of Shield is hanging out with aliens. You know, <laughs> like that to me is way more. That fun sounds than, a lot more like real life. That's way more interesting. Yeah, I love when people yeah. are like, well, the the tones would mix. It's like, yeah, it'd be like imagine for a second if the events of like rudy took place same world as titanic wouldn't that be crazy as i flip through the channels and afghanistan's falling apart and then i put on cartoon network it's like yeah it's the, the literally tone is it's like jimmy fallon is being unfunny on one channel but the events of like india and, and afghanistan are happening it's almost like life is complex and filled with all kinds of different emotions and feelings and experiences hey there listener want to influence the podcast Head on over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support the show for $3 a month. In doing so, you'll be able to vote on a movie poll that picks a film we discuss each month. So jump on over there and have your voice heard. Well, it's just like it's that hope and holding on to canon. Like if this one thing can just be right in my life. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's the worst. I don't know. Canon is frustrating because I think like for me, like as I've grown to just watch more and more and more and more of all kinds of things. I, I'm just more interested in just like, is it interesting to the story? And yeah, there are times when canon is frustrating. I mentioned Gears of War in another episode and like Gears 1 through 3 as a story are really strong and then ends. Like 3 ends. <laughs> the way the story ends is like great. Like everything that's happened to these characters and that I participated in is over. And then literally 4 and 5 to just continue the franchise for some more games four is, is non-existent as a story but like five the way it like adds new plot elements to the story it like recontextualizes the canon of certain things that take place in one through three and like at the end of the day it's like i like five i like the gameplay i like the story and i like what is added but i also don't because it really changes the the quote unquote canon of how the first three are told. It like gives you additional information that you don't need, which almost always seems to be the pitfall of storytelling is giving too much information to the, the audience. I mean, that's how horror movies yeah. fall apart is if you give way too much information, it's like, like Michael Myers is Laurie Strode's brother or whatever it is, is I think is in the is in Halloween like three or four. I think it's in four. Well, then Michael like, Myers becomes like a mystical spirit thing that can, transfer bodies or something right yeah well that's also jason they do that with they try to do that with jason they do that twice yeah they do it in five <laughs> so and funny. they do it in like uh jason uh, goes to hell or whatever but it's just like no just 
just keep the mystery of like it's just a big buff guy who, who died in a lake and he wears a hockey mask that's all i need you don't need to give me more yeah all you need to know about jason is the visual of jason that's it yeah <laughs> and that's why it's great he's got to be a big strong dude who is intimidating and he has a tool belt that could kill you that's cool and like the more you give me the more things can fall apart so like in gears 5 that's kind of how it is or you're talking canon i i would love to figure out the canon for halo five. Cause literally it's like you had to read like nine or 10 additional pieces of information. So like a series of books, comic books, particular side story lore from the other games, just to know what the heck's going on in five. And like, that's not interesting. That's feeding canon for like the specific people who care so much about it. But at the end of the day, what matters is just what's in front of you. In the development for the first three Halo games, when or actually the first series, the Bungie games, so Halo 1, 2, 3, ODST, and Reach, when they're working on Reach during development, there was like a question of like, well, doesn't like, if we do this with the story, it conflicts with the Halo Reach book that Eric Nyland wrote? <laughs> and like, I think... Um, Sorry, that's the funniest thing ever. <laughs> it's great. And I forget the composer's name. I can't believe I'm forgetting it for um, Halo. Uh, someone listening knows because his music's amazing. But he literally says like, those books are good. But what matters is the game, so I don't care. <laughs> it's just so what he said. He's like, I don't care. Like, what matters is what's the purpose of what we're making with this game. That's what's most important. And whatever is in the game is going to be canon. And great, <laughs> you can still yeah. go read the book if you want. And it's kind of a cool book. But and even then, even if there's conflicting canon, what's interesting about storytelling is to think like, well, if this character was in this situation, what would he do? And then you're still learning about the character at large. I mean, that's what we've been doing with Batman forever is <laughs> really just like it's interesting to have like as long as you have core tenets of a character emblematic to that character in the story, you're still learning about the fiction of the character as opposed to like what is the specific canon? Because like if you like it's part of what makes it difficult to read like the classic DC comics is because there isn't like a book one, book two, book three to like put it in an order. It's like, oh, you want to know what's really cool about like classic Batman? Pick up Long Halloween, Killing Joke, Arkham Asylum. And I would probably put them in that order. Like, actually, no, I don't know. Long Halloween, Killing Joke, I really like. But Arkham Asylum is definitely my least favorite of the three. Well, that's my favorite. And Killing Joke is my least favorite. So I don't Every time I read it, though, it moves me. Killing Joke. But the point is, is there's really. I think year one is better than Killing Joke personally. And that's just me. I think Long Halloween's great. I too. think I enjoy your one, but it's too vague. Hush is great. I don't know. Something about it feels vague to me. I'll have to reread it. Dark Victory is underrated. You can quote me on that internet. Pick up um, Batman Hush is in that. But like, what's the order of those? I don't know. And I don't care. Like some people have tried to put an order to them and they're like Killing Joke happens right after Long Halloween. But like when Killing Joke was written, um, there Alan Moore was like, it's not in canon. It's just its own thing. Yeah. Yeah. But then people liked it so much that they put it in canon. It's like, I don't I don't understand. This is too much for me. It doesn't matter. It's just a good story. Just I'm I'm literally running my hands over my face and peeling it down. It doesn't matter where it is in the canon. Just read it and go, that was good. And then go to work because you have a shift now or something. It doesn't matter. I just, yeah, that's how I feel ultimately about canon. <laughs> and I love that Tommy Westfall makes all this stuff fall apart because it's like, who cares? Because it's all just in some kid's brain. That's so much better. What's great about the Tommy Westfall thing is it illustrates both the strength and weaknesses of it. Because like just to you, John Munch is just a great example of this, which is it makes things some things better because you're building off of this like world weary character where part of what makes him like there's a thing where he becomes a sergeant in lawn or svu which is funny because on homicide life in the street he kept not making sergeant like he kept failing the exam so it's like <laughs> the continuation of this character <laughs> oh, so there's, i finally graduated yeah there's it's like cute. all this fun stuff or like and marvel's make universe also does this some stuff really well like you get a character's like complete character arc across multiple movies and now potentially even across television shows and potentially, potentially, you get to see characters who originally on television shows have full, like, formative, like, act ones and even act twos of their arc. They get then get to get fulfilled in film with other characters. And, like, what's great about the characters is you, like, characters bring out other things in each other. So you get to have all these different characters meet. And having those consistent characterization of them helps make those things stronger. That is where canon is great. 
but where it is very, very weak is <laughs> both in this like obsessiveness of it, but also in this like, or it's this thing that you're beholden to. Reddit posts where you're complaining about Masters of the Universe. Yeah, or like, yeah, we're talking about Masters of the Universe. But like you're talking about like, some things are better with less detail. This is all just detail. This is just all like extraneous detail right. that could bog down a good old movie or good old story, you know? And like when, when it's like the perfect, you can't see the forest for the trees kind of thing, I think with this sort of thing. But yeah, part of why I wanted to lay this to bed finally, just to exercise my own demons is we are potentially on the cusp of everything just going completely insane. As far as you mean in the MCU, in the MCU, because I mean, also in real life, probably, but right. Well, where uh, now the what if cartoon is airing as we were recording this, it has aired two episodes and the writers have been like, this is all canon because the multiverse (laughs) It's like the most like odd, odd, offbeat, like weird stories. And then we're also potentially thinking of Spider-Man, potentially all the Spider-Man movies are technically canon. And then then we're going to have multiverse events. So like we're in this and then Loki. So we're in this place where all of this canon might be expanded. And there's going to be debates and arguments and articles. Same thing with the Flash movie. Flash is go- he's going to meet the Michael Keaton Batman, which Michael Keaton in an interview pointed out he has no idea how any of it works, which makes me want to see it more. And now there's a thing with like, well, is is the is Zack Snyder's stuff canon? Is it not? And guys, the answer is sure. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Sure. It, don't don't. I, it, will I get mad about certain things? Probably. May, yeah. will, I all, will I let it ruin my life? No. <laughs> well, it's it, it's all canon. None of it's canon. It's all made up. It's fictitious. None of it's real. None of it. It's just they're stories. And these are characters. These are characters that I hold dear, near and dear to my heart. And as I mentioned, I've been watching. I saw Iron Man one in theaters. It's their day one baby, and I've been here for the <laughs> ride. Nice. And maybe maybe I'll get off the ride eventually when it becomes too cumbersome to keep a hold of. And it's fine, but. Don't waste your time arguing with people on Twitter and Reddit and reading all these articles and leaving mean comments in the articles because someone tried to tell you that The Runaways isn't canon or because the movies make it where some of the movies are canon or not or whatever. It's a, it's it's all in Tommy's head, so it's okay. <laughs> Blame that kid. As 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 uh, Dwight McDuffie pointed out, uh, the only television that's real is the last two or three minutes of Staying Elsewhere and everything else is made up, so... Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Cinematic Doctra. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review and subscribing to the podcast. And as mentioned before, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once a month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, Melanie, Sherlyon, and Thomas. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay cool. The research for this was done. Part of it is just like this is general nerd knowledge, and I literally, for example, for like the Mimi thing uh, from Drew Carey, I just went to the actress's Wikipedia page and looked through all the times she was credited as Mimi <laughs> and something, <laughs> and then double checked to make sure that was what's happening. Yeah, but there's a great book, uh, great, great book. There's a great video put out by the old PBS Idea Channel, which used to be one of my favorite YouTube channels before they shut it down. Uh, they did a 10 minute video talking about this uh, phenomenon. I also checked the, of course, the master list as well as some stuff on crossover wiki. And there's a five minute video put out by a guy who these days he's a little disgraced because he has some wild political opinions, but he had a great five minute video on the subject uh, called movie Bob and as well as just like some other research, mm-hmm. but this is a fun nerd phenomenon that is fun to look at. We, we, I know we make fun of nerds on the show a lot, but some of the stuff is just rewarding because it's fun and weird and mm-hmm. that's the reward enough. So th- those are some of the areas of research that I checked out. So want some cinematic doctrine swag, you're in luck. We've got three inch cinematic doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine link in the show notes and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too, but let's be real. The podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.